On today's show, we're going to talk about Jay Crowder, Karis LeVert, and some other Cavs-y preseason things. That's all coming up today. I want to thank you again, by the way, for making Lockdown Cavs your first listen every day. Remember, we are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. You are Locked On Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. All right, the music heard on the way in is from our friends at Astro Radio. I'm Chris Manning, covering the Cavs and the NBA at large for places like Diamond Up Rocks and Estimations for the Sword. Evan Damrell is my co-host. He is primarily at Meta's Red Zone Euclid. We have a special guest today, the Chase Downs, Justin Rowan, the more handsome half, dare I say, of the Chase Down. Justin, what's good, brother? How are you? I'm doing fantastic. It is great to be talking with you guys again. Thank you so much for having me on. And thank you for that introduction, Chris. We once got a review once that said, uh, it, or the, when they sent in the email, they said the handsome one and the funny one. And I was so offended by that email because I'm like, I want to be both. I don't, I don't even know which one I'd rather be. But uh, thank you. Thank you for that intro, Chris. Well, well, you are handsome and verified. So you have both of those things on Carter at this point. That, that is verified indeed, my friend. <laughs> Take that, Carter. All right. Segment one today, we're going to talk about Karis LeVert. Segment two, we're going to talk about Dean Wade and his starting options, kind of, and then kind of vibe through Okoro and, and some of these other guys. And also, at the end of the show, we're going to talk about Jay Crowder because he has been linked to the Cavs, at least in one little note, nothing super substantial. But you know what? We have to fill podcast segments here. So we're going to talk about Bossman99. In all caps, just we're going to talk very loudly about Jay Crowder. But guys, I'm going to start with a point about Karis LeVert that I, I've been thinking about since media day. And when he said, like, I've played in with two guard lineups before. So I went back and like pulled the numbers on him playing in two guard lineups. I, I want to ask you both. Would you say if, would it before, and maybe you looked at this. So if you looked at this already in the outline, Evan is in that outline right now. Justin is not. Would you say, would you guess that they are good or bad based on on-off numbers? Give me a guess, just good or bad. We'll go Evan first, then to Justin. Just give me good or bad. Bad. I, I would... Instinct says bad. Um, I, a, I just... But, you know, one. at the same time, like, those Nets teams weren't terrible. So I, I guess in, it was like D'Lo, Dinwiddie, and Karras, and Kyrie, Dinwiddie, and Karras, right? Yeah, so your instincts were right. They are bad. Yeah. So 2018-19, Lavert with Dinu and Russell on the court, 256 possessions. So like they didn't use it very much. Minus 15.9 per hundred possessions. 2019-20, that's Irving, Dinwiddie, Lavert, only 138 possessions, plus 2.3 per hundred. 115 on off, 115.9 on offense, 113.7 on on defense. 2020-2021. Uh, before he's traded, 79 possessions with Irm Irving and Shamit. If you remember, I believe uh, Dinwiddie's hurt that year, but very little use mm -hmm. in terms of three guard lineups. I think what is interesting about this is two things. Number one, the biggest sample size and sort of like isn't particularly good. The other part of this is that the fours in 2018 19 in particular are just so different than what the Cavs could do with this. And it makes me wonder if you have to look at it in a different lighter because. It was in this order. This was the most commonly used four um, in the lineups with Levert playing with two guards: Jared Dudley, Rondé Hollis Jefferson, Joe Harris, and Damari Carroll. Mm. The next year in 2019-20, Jared Allen is mostly at the center, so like there's some obviously some similarities there. But then it go you go to Joe Harris, Torian Prince, Wilson Chandler, and Rodon Rodon Kruj. So like you are. When you're think, I think when we're thinking about Lavert as a three, and think on him playing with Dot Mitchell and Garland, there is something about it that I think we can look at and say, okay, there's some reason to think that this won't work. The other part of this is that like this is going to look different just because the personnel, specifically at the four, because Evan Mobley is not Jared Dudley, or Rodney Hollis, Jefferson, or Damari Carroll, or Joe Harris. He is like a budding superstar. There's a different function for what you can expect out of it, and I, I kind of want to just see it now. I kind of want to just see what this would look like with those two guys, with Lavert, and like what you can get out of him in those situations. Yeah, I would be surprised to see it at some point. Like I, I don't, 
I don't know necessarily. In a vacuum, Karis LeVert is probably the Cavs' fifth best player, right? Like, I, I think in terms of like an upside standpoint, like he's probably proven the most. I think you can make an impact or a comment about like Isaac Okoro's impact or uh, Kevin Love, you know, obviously playing a, a close to six man of the year. But I, I think I feel comfortable saying Karras is probably that fifth best player. But from a fit standpoint, I just like personally, I'm, I'm going to value guys like Dean Wade or Isaac Okoro alongside kind of the core four. But when you look at Karras Levert, like back in those Brooklyn days, funny enough, like he kind of got used as a quote unquote stopper and he wasn't good, but he wasn't bad. Like he, he kind of was like, you know, he, he was buying in, he was giving effort on that end. And functionally, like that's what Lowry provided with the Cavs last year, right? Was like just length, moving feet, effort and staying in position. So if he's really kind of dedicating to himself, I can see it kind of working. I just think having all three ball handlers on the court at one time, it probably just isn't the best way to kind of allocate minutes over a 48 minute game. Yeah, it's tricky. Um, I, I, to Justin's point, like you could notice sometimes in Brooklyn that he was viewed and showcased as a stopper, but I think that's maybe just the, the reality of the situation that the Nets are doing. And as you noted, Chris, like they had a lot of interesting guys who were a bit of a tweener playing at the four as well to maybe cover up a little bit of the defensive issues that LeVert made it possessed with the Nets as well. And having Jared Allen as like a backline defense person, both with the Nets and now with the Cavs, like helps a lot. I think having Evan Mobley cover you a lot too certainly helps too. But I, I, I'm just of the mentality when I look at Karis LeVert just as a player, like he could be your super quote unquote six man. I mean, you could say him or Kevin Love is your six man at the end of the day, but either way, they're both like your primary options off the bench. And I agree with Justin's assessment. Like we don't know if we're going to get the same season out of Kevin Love, but like right now, just in terms of just pure basketball skills and just position wise, like where LeVert fits, like he is Cleveland's arguably fifth best player at this time. So you kind of have to figure out where he fits in all this and JB was talking about this a little bit during training camp just asking him like hey you guys have two fairly ball dominant guards in Darius Garland and Donovan Mitchell and Karis Levert's also a guard that really succeeds best when he has the ball in his hands and JB's like well we're gonna get him more spot up opportunities we need to get him more comfortable playing without the ball in his hands and I think that's all well and good if you're able to maximize that if you're able to let him keep defenses honest on the perimeter as a shooter like I think that's great but it's just in my eyes at least right now with Karis Levert the best way to utilize him is with the ball in his hands, or maybe you don't stagger him as much when you have him on the floor with Garland and Mitchell both, because you're kind of limiting his upside a little bit. But it makes more sense as him, and just in regards to this, like figuring out the mystery of the starting small forward for the Cavs, it makes more sense to have Levert come off the bench. Do you play him with one of Garland, one of Mitchell, and then maybe you also throw in Ricky Rubio in there as well, just when he's healthy, or Hollow Neto while Ruby recovers just as an extra primary ball handler who maybe just doesn't need to do as much offensively just in terms of scoring. Like, I think there's just more creative ways to utilize Levert. And I don't know. I think the defensive stuff might be a little bit overblown because, at least in Cleveland, because you have two aliens kind of covering your back line like that. And to Justin's point, like, defense is an effort thing. Like, Chris, we had Andy Bailey on the other day where we were talking about Donovan Mitchell and how when Mitchell was coming out of Louisville, he was viewed as, like, a pretty stout defender and then that just the perception changed because he was asked to do so much offensively in Utah that maybe the Cavs try and get Levert to tap in so he's more of a 50-50 player instead of maybe like a 70 offense 30 defense player or 80 offense 20 defense player the thing that I think complicates all of this more than anything else is that like even though JB can say we need to get him comfortable in spot up stuff we need to do that that's just not what Levert ever has been like he doesn't make spot up threes He's better. He's always been better making pull-up threes than spot-up threes. And even mm -hmm. then, he's not like a particularly efficient three-point shooter. So, like, I, I, this is that to me is almost like the crux of the problem. Is like, what do you do with Karis Levert if he's just there? Like, is he like what is he totally providing you? Is like really the question in terms of him starting. I think there's value for him to take pressure off of the two guards. I think he plus those two guys gives Rubio in particular a longer kind of runway to come back and get healthy and be right when he plays. It's also the tricky part that Lavert is playing for his next contract this year. Like he is in he's mm -hmm. on the last year of his contract. So like there's just like a lot of weirdness in like what his role is going to be like. And I, I would be I would also just like 
he he said at media day the thing that that also stuck with me from him was like defenses are going to have to choose between like putting their worst defender on me donovan mitchell and darius garland and guess what nine out of ten times unless these teams are making a mistake when and that tenth time is probably a mistake the worst defender is going on Karis Levert. But so that's also kind of fun, though, right? But like, yeah. but is he, but the it's question is then is he good enough to take advantage of that over and over and over again and make that a real pressure point? And I think like that that I don't think we know that. I don't think like you should feel great about like that being something he can just press on and press on and press on over and over again. For sure, uh, I I think the contract point is interesting, but like I think contract year means different things for different people right like I, I think at this point of Karis Levert's career nobody's bringing him in to be a number one or number two option I mean I guess Indiana technically did like replacing Oladipo with him but like him showing that he can fit in in a winning team context and kind of round out his game I think is probably the clearest path to him getting a payday uh, moving forward so it, it's funny because as much as like if I'm kind of playing this out of my head right like and I, I think we're all kind of prone to let our biases kick in. Like, the, And I try to have an open mind going into camp because at this time last year, if you told me Lowry was starting at the three, I'd call you insane. Like, it doesn't make any sense, right? We'll see what works as the best unit. But even though I like Karis LeVert coming in off the bench, I kind of want him playing with a lot of the starters more. Like, I want him, when you're staggering, to be with Darius Garland and Jaron Allen in particular because he is yeah. a good pick-and-roll ball handler. Whereas Donovan Mitchell, I think if you're staggering, I'd like Mitchell with either Neto or Rubio, as well as Kevin Love and Evan Mobley, right? A little bit more of a pick and pop threat, allowing uh, Mitchell to attack the rim the way that he can. Like if you're talking about game flow and the staggering, I like Karras more with Garland and Allen in particular, because I think that's the best way to kind of maximize his skill set. But I, I agree with you guys. Like I, I think from just a starting lineup perspective, unless Karis LeVert has made strides in ways that I don't really foresee, it makes more sense to me for him to come off of the bench. This is the selling point they're doing. Um, after the break, though, we're going to move on to talking about the starting three spot a little bit more. And we're going to open up with Dean Wade. And I'm gonna we're going to let Evan tee off on that first and tell us what he thinks about Dean oh, Wade as a possible okay. starting three. You look a little confused there, but that's what we're going to do. But first... Gotta tell I didn't everyone. Know she, I didn't know what she meant by tee off. I Fine. thought she wanted me to like lead in this segment. I was like, well, sure, I can. I mean, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw you a nice lob in the break. But first, gotta tell everyone about our friends at Bet Online. Bet Online is your number one source for your pro and college football betting needs and sports info this season. I think they even have the CFL. Find all of the latest football league developments, game matchup news, and podcasts, including this year's slate of games every single week. BetOnline is also your continued source for your sports wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. It is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite sports and events, including the MLB, MMA, MMA, boxing, golf, and the NBA. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. For instance, Evan Mobley is plus 1,600 to win Defensive Player of the Year. The Cavs over under, meanwhile, I said at 46 and a half after they got Donovan Mitchell. Taking the over on that. Bet online where the game starts. Justin, are you also taking the over on that? Chris, I bet the over on the Cavs prior to the Mitchell trade. I'm feeling fantastic. Oh. I got a like 42 and a half, I think. Oh, or something look at like you that. just cashing out smart feeling man. Feeling good about it. Feeling, feeling real good about feeling it. Feeling great about see, that. You see, when you're always going optimistic, sometimes it pays off. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're also just, you know, it's it's all we're a long way from Carter having uh, his illicit habits. Anyway, uh, and this all being a little more uh, kosher, let's just say. All right, mm -hmm. Evan. Don't, don't get Carter fired. Uh, the the benefits divorce. of me living it up in lawless Canada, where this has just, just been my entire life. Is the, yeah, sports you, betting being legal. Just, what, a, what a world. You're going to have, they're going to have kiosks like everywhere downtown. Now they're Kroger in the grocery store chain is trying to get them. Wild times. All right, Evan, Dean Wade. I say to you, yeah. Dean Wade is the starting three. For the Cleveland Cavaliers, if I tell you that's going to happen, what do you make of of that option? Well, I'm of a few schools of thought, and I've wrote about this a bit for Fear the Sword when doing his um, seasonal preview as well, where 
it, it makes sense where you can maybe get 55 to 60, possibly 65% of what Larry Markkinen provides you in terms of just floor spacing and just, you know, size as well. To Justin's point, like Larry is just so big and long that it kind of frustrated people on the on the wing at least. And then also, you know, if he got blown past, you funnel them into one of Mobley and Allen. So like you could get something there. But also Wade is just a different player, uh, player wise than marketing is as well i think he's a little bit more better defensively i think he looked pretty good in certain spot starts as well but to me it's just i think the contract extension that dean wade signed more or less i mean, yes obviously keeps him in cleveland and makes him an attractive trade chip if he does continue to level up because he is only in his mid-20s right now um i still think there is some potential for him to grow as a player and i think he's just better suited as more of like your third big behind um or your fourth big rather behind uh Mobley, Allen, and Love at that point. And I think that's a good way to use him where and I make this argument a lot where Dean Wade is kind of in a similar vein to Lamar Stevens, where if you call him his number that they will he will provide you reliable minutes and he doesn't look like he's completely lost on the floor and just overwhelmed by the situation. But more than anything, if Dean Wade's starting at the three, it's because JB Pickerstaff really likes this tall ball situation that he built last year and he wants to maintain just the status quo a little bit and maybe be a little bit more static with how he goes about things as they figure out the Donovan Mitchell wrinkle. And also just maybe maybe Isaac Okoro's shot just isn't as far along as we had hoped and just he isn't able to be like a reliable presence on either end of the floor, especially offense in that regard. That's just how I feel about it. Justin? Yeah, I, I think Evan's pretty much bang on there. Like, I, I, I think Dean Wade proved uh, last season that he can step in and be that starting three in, in a pinch. And I think that's even more functional now that you have Garland and Mitchell, right? Like, what's being asked of the small four position is going to be less. Uh, if Evan Mobley is taking a meaningful step forward offensively, what you need from the small forward position is less, right? And uh, you guys have reported as well um, that in the exit interviews, a lot of kind of the direction that Dean Wade and Lamar Stevens got going into the offseason was, hey, we want you to play more at the small forward position. We want you to kind of work on your skill set to play more of the wing. So we'll see what that work, uh, what, what the fruits of that are. Um, I do think an interesting dynamic of the extension is we talked about after the Mitchell trade, how the Cavs have a pretty good chunk of cap space uh, going into the next summer. And the fact that you kind of cut into that a little bit with Dean Wade kind of makes me feel like maybe they're feeling a little bit more confident about the in-house options at the small forward position. Of course, like it, that's, it, it's easy to say that now, like if it doesn't work out and they still need to like reopen up that cap space, I think that's relatively easy to do. Like even going back to the summer of the return, right? Like they didn't have cap space and, you found ways to kind of uh, offload salaries and open that space back up. Well, him, um, but J him and Jetty are basically like a wash. Like, if you're going to non guarantee Jetty, like, Dean Wade slides into that and, like, you're in the same place you would have been otherwise. It, exactly. Right. Like, the, there are mechanisms to open up the space if you want. But um, as it currently stands, you're kind of maybe with the remaining space looking at, like, a backup wing, right? R rather mm -hmm. than bringing in, like, a Harrison Barnes or someone that would really kind of solidify that three spot. So I, I think going into this, um, Isaac Okoro still kind of stands out to me as the guy that I would expect to see starting at the small forward position. But then thinking from a fit standpoint, I think Dean Wade's that number two for me. Like I, I've just really liked what Dean has brought to the table. And I think the other thing that this extension kind of solidified for me as well is that maybe Dean's a little higher in the pecking order than Lamar Stevens. Like I, I think that's yeah. something that's always been tough for me to, to weigh from an outside perspective because, you know, Lamar's brought a lot to the table and these guys fill very similar roles. But I, I think Dean's more kind of refined two-way game um, mm -hmm. kind of gives him that little bit of that nod. Plus, plus he's just bigger, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I think where I can see the argument for Wade, I think most clear vis -vis, I think Okoro, is that like maybe he's not going to provide some of the defensive stuff I think you ideally would want. Like, Okoro's going to be able to defend the point of attack or defend a wing score. You can use that. Wade's going to basically just have to defend a wing guy, and you're going to do what you did last year, which is switch everything with your bigs. Like, you're just going to do a lot of the same mm -hmm. stuff. And I think they would do that with Karis Levert to some degree as well, right? Like, I think the way they're, that they're talking about Levert and Levert is talking about his role makes you seem like maybe they're going to ask him to do more, but like, I don't, I suspect you just rely on Mobley and Allen to like, do Mobley and Allen things um, yeah. or the complicated. 
I think that we're Wade. Wade is gonna like shoot threes well enough to do attack closeouts and try to dunk on people, and he's gonna move the ball, and he's not just gonna stand in the corner. Okoro, like to date, just what his offense is is just sort of like you're hoping that he makes enough corner threes and like maybe like people rotate wrong wrong or he can get on out on the break and, and get a transition bucket, right? Like he is just like limited. Where Wade is at least doing some stuff even if some of the defensive stuff is there. And he's maybe like the best balance to some degree of two sides of the ball. Kokoro is very much skewed, I think, defensively. Levert, I feel, is very much skewed towards the offensive side of the ball. Wade is sort of mm-hmm. mostly the 50-50 guy. And Lamar is like very much more in the Okoro camp of like, okay, like you just don't shoot well enough for us to really feel great about this. And he's a worse, he's just a worse shooter than Okoro. And if you're a worse shooter than Isaac Okoro, we have we have some problems about you starting as a, as a three unless you have a bunch of other shooters around you. Yeah, like it's it's the most boring possible answer, but really we're going to find out once the games actually happen, like once the preseason games, like that's going to be informative. Like Isaac Okoro playing sound on ball defense and hitting some like uh, corner threes or catch and shoot threes in practice isn't going to stand out the same way like Karis Levert's dynamic offense is, right? If Evan Mobley takes a step forward where he's maybe playing a little more from the perimeter or he's a, a hub from the high post that's going to open up a coral slash game right like that's going to open up different aspects that he can bring to the table that maybe a dean wade wouldn't bring to the table so i think what stage garland mitchell mobley are at that's going to dictate what exactly we need from the small forward position and i i, I still think like it, it's funny because Okoro in a lot of ways is like the inverse of Colin Sexton where Colin Sexton was putting up really good box score stats, but the lineups didn't work. Uh, Isaac Okoro doesn't put up the box score stats, but the lineup stats always end up looking good. So mm-hmm. uh, I, I think JB is going to try to have as many good units and balance out the talent over a 40, 48 minute uh, rotation. And to me, like the baseline for Okoro, like what he was doing last year it's not like this is Dylan Windler where there's no production. He was a really good on-ball defender. He he was hitting shots at a really low volume, but he was like hitting shots. He shot 50-40 uh, a- after December. Like if he just builds on the volume of what he was already doing, that's probably going to be enough if Garland, Mitchell, and Mobley are what we expect them to be. Yeah, I, I agree with that assessment 100%, Justin. And it's, it's interesting you mentioned... Mobley acting as a facilitator at the top of the key. I asked him a little bit on this um, today after practice at training camp just because he, he mentioned during tr- um, media day that like, hey, I want to be taking more three-pointers. I want to be initiating the offense a lot more and be just being used as an offensive hub. And he explicitly mentioned he's like, guys that are cutting, guys that are kind of like sprinting to the perimeter, like I can get them the ball a little bit easier, especially if defenses start to collapse on different guys and everything. Like that's an interesting way to look at it. And I've just kind of maintained the stance of Isaac Okoro that I don't need him to be like a plus, plus, plus shooter. I just need him to be slightly below average just so he can keep opposing defenses honest so that when the Cavs are on offense, like if you're playing like a team like Golden State or a team like the Celtics who are more forward heavy and they can kind of hide a better defender on Isaac and then sack off him and then frustrate one of Garland, Mitchell, etc. and so on, like that, that's where it just kind of gets tough. And I think maybe the dynamism of having donovan mitchell kind of unlock things a lot too for the Cavs because those two just between him and garland possess so much gravity that you're going to be able to kind of maybe not prioritize the small forward spot which i think is something we all three of us agree on is the Cavs are loaded one through one two four and five in their starting lineup like for small forward they need a guy who can be that 50 50 guy maybe that's where you make the argument for dean wade where you have a guy who is competent enough on offense where he isn't going to look completely lost and he can keep defenses honest but on defense he's able to support the you know the the back line you have and also just kind of maybe play through some of the frustrations and perimeter pressure that has you dealing with when you have garland and mitchell on the floor together so like there's it's an interesting argument with just like coro for me is like arguably their best perimeter defender i mean it depends on how you feel about lamar stevens but if you put a coro yeah, out there yeah, he's, he's he, I, I think he i think he is i think he just okay. is yeah, he just okay. We're all in agreement on that. So if he <laughs> just can slow down the perimeter attack a little bit. It's just the offensive stuff. I need to kind of just watch him play in preseason and then get a decent sample size when the games actually matter to kind of say like, okay, 
Isaac Okoro has improved in these ways offensively because he was honest at his exit interview. Like he said, like I wasn't good as a shooter. I wasn't very good offensively. I was also just not comfortable playing without the ball in my hand. So like his evolution and trajectory is fascinating to me because I think there is a very good player in there. It's just he just never had the runway to develop it, whether it was the COVID season or the fact that the Cavs just kind of became very good when they got Evan Mobley. And now they said, okay, Isaac, we don't really have the runway to let you kind of learn from your mistakes on the fly now. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's go into one more break. We're going to finish by talking about Bossman 99, Jay Crowder after this. All right. Back here in Lockdown Cavs. I'm Chris Manning. That's Amy Damrell. Justin Rowan is with us from the Chase Down. So that's Jay Crowder, former Cav uh, during the, the 2018 season, obviously part of the uh, Kyrie trade, which which played out in a certain way. Jay Crowder, part of the most awkward press conference I've ever been to in my life. The Isaiah Thomas, Ante Zizic, Jay Crowder, Kobe Altman presser. What a, what a day that was in Independence. He makes sense to me on paper because I think a three and a half bigger wing is like a need on this team, I think. I think two things. Number one, I think when you're thinking about the Cavs' wing position, I think just based on being a salary cap league, based on being just a league where you can't just spend whatever you want and get whoever you want, there's always going to be this little bit of angst about finding the perfect three. I don't think you're ever going to have an option who is just perfect. If so, you would just be like, like then this is then this this is not the structure of how the NBA works. Like you can't just go get anyone you want at, at the right time. Like you have to get very lucky to luck into the right guys at the right time and, and leverage them correctly, all of that. Secondly, there's just not a trade here that like makes sense. Like, like Jetty would be like the obvious salary point, but like what does Phoenix, who probably is still trying to contend, ha- like just Jetty doesn't really make sense for them for what they would need and what they'd be losing to some degree, unless they're just like very sure Cam Johnson can absorb all of what Crowder provides. Um, I, I think like this is the kind of thing that like you do absolutely need to explore. Is it perfect? Is it a long term solution? No, but like it makes sense to me to like look at this and say like I think Crowder could help you for a year. I don't really see how a trade kind of manifests here though. I the thing is after the Donovan Mitchell trade, you emptied a lot of the war chest when it comes to assets and i think if you're looking to make upgrades to the roster and if it is going to cost like even if it's going to cost one second round pick you got to really kind of examine how meaningful is this upgrade and what is the opportunity cost and when you look at jay crowder to me he's someone you know he's 32 years old he shot below 40 percent or pretty much let's round up it's 39.9 percent 40 percent from the field and shot under 35 percent from three when you look at like a Dean Wade, both of them have like identical three point rates. They they take three pointers at about sixty seven percent of their possessions. Like they they are three and D guys, right? Uh, Dean Wade is obviously younger. He you've invested money in him. He shot better from three on pretty similar volume, but you know Crowder's volume would go down if it was with the Cavs. Is he going to be happy when he's not happy in Phoenix? He wants a contract. He, he wants a contract extensions. Yeah. I think at the root he wants of this. to start, right? He he wants to start, and I'm not necessarily like sure how meaningful an upgrade is over Dean Wade. Like I think there's an experience factor with Jay Crowder that's really meaningful. Like I I think he's not going to be shy of the moment. Whereas I don't know if that's going to be the case with a Dean Wade. Uh, you look at the opportunity and cost of okay, it's going to take away development developmental minutes for Isaac Okoro. Isaac Okoro, someone, I pointed this out on the chase down, but like he's got a longer standing reach than Jay Crowder when you're talking about like defending wings. That's like, there's going to be a learning curve for Okoro. And I think he, his biggest thing is he needs to learn how to get a little more physical up in those bigger wings. Crowder, when Crowder's, also, about, Crowder's also thicker. Crowder is just like 235 and like right side. Like he's but big, but he's that's what you want Isaac to kind of build towards. So you have to think of the opportunity cost from a minute standpoint if Jay isn't part of your long-term future. So if the cost is jetty and you kind of do the math, you look at what you have in-house during training camp and maybe through preseason and you don't feel as confident, maybe you do a move like that. But like 
personally, I would like to see just the in-house options get run, uh, especially if it's going to cost an asset. I wouldn't na necessarily be in favor of that because I just, I'm not convinced it's a meaningful upgrade. And when you look at just the, just the kind of his attitude towards the, the whole situation in Phoenix, like I just don't want to kind of risk the vibes mm -hmm. when it seems to be so, as Darius Garland put it, immaculate right now. See, that's that's kind of where I'm at because Jay Crowder was a disgruntled player during his time with the Cavs, clearly. Like, he also was dealing stuff off the court just to empathize with him a little bit as well. But just him leaving Cleveland is probably the happiest he's been that season because he looked so much better with the Jazz, just better off mentally with the Jazz than he was with the Cavs. But alas, that that was then and this is now and to justin's point he wants out of a contending situation in phoenix he's kind of making a stink again he tweeted then deleted um just you know the classic phoenix just player move there but like cam johnson is going to supersede him in the rotation and to justin's point like there is a reality in a situation where jay crowder doesn't start for the Cavs either like what if dean wade starts ahead of him what if isaac okoro starts ahead of him let's and to, again to justin's point if you're just saying like okay Phoenix approaches you and says, hey, we're not getting a lot of handsome offers for Jay Crowder, and we will take Jetty Osman, and then they can kind of talk about the brass tacks and just the semantics of the trade at that point. If you're just bringing in Jay Crowder to, like, bolster your wing rotation, I guess that makes sense. But again, he's in a contract year. He would wants to start. I think that's his biggest issue with the situation in Phoenix is he's no longer going to be starting because of Cam Johnson. He may not start in Cleveland, and if you believe in your heart of hearts that your culture is too solid to fail, and I feel like if you ask the Cavs, like, hey, culturally, like, we're in a really good place, maybe we can afford to take a swing like this, kind of like how the Cavs did with J.R. Smith to an extent, but, I mean, LeBron helped with that in that sense, but... I just don't know if you really want to rock the boat that much for a guy who may not be happy, and then you end up just cashing in the few assets you have left for a a, a sunk. I mean, I know it's a sunk fallacy. It's a it's a fallacy. The 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 lost the lost trade fallacy, but still, like <clears throat> you don't really want to cash in the few assets you have left unless you're in your heart of hearts and. This is also just a Cavs team that doesn't typically overreact organization wise, unless like it's an absolutely pressing need. I think they'll just look at the in house options. And if it's not working by the deadline, that's when they'd probably make a stronger move like that. But for now, you just see what you have and more so try to figure out like this new offensive lifestyle with Mitchell and Garland running the show. This would be a clear this would be a clear move for Gar for Crowder if this is like two years from now and you're firmly, firmly, firmly in your championship window. Right? Like if you're like, okay, we are all in chips, like if if the chips are on the table, you're gunning for a title and we a thir we think a thirty two year old could really help us. That is the situation, I think, more so where, like, a, mm -hmm. a Crowder move makes some sense. I do think, like, like the profile of Crowder is still kind of the thing you're looking at. Like, could Lamar oh, Stevens yeah. develop into that? Could, could like, are they going to get the good enough shooting and size-wise to get there? I think that's still, like, kind of an open question. But I think that is really what you're looking for as far as, like, the size. And, like, to, to the Crowder is, like, a person point. I think, like, the vibes around him and the 2018 Cavs were just, like, very tough in the beginning. I think there's just some some disgruntledness. I also think if you go, like, at the Miami, him in Miami, he, that was, like, the guy who would, like, call out Jimmy Butler. Like, there's some really good... You can go read some stuff on him and Jimmy playing one-on-one -on -one in the bubble and, like, mm -hmm. him being a guy that could really call out Jimmy. And, like, there is something there's to have. There's a value that. in that. There's a value yeah. in that. And, like, I think if you're telling me that, like, that is an energy the Cavs, like... I don't know if there's a guy in the locker room A that is like that. And B, if you told me that like this group could ha like can handle some of that, I think they can. This is not like a di when you have a coach like Bickerstaff who is like very much th if they're who has built a lot of this and I think is very open about stuff and is very they're creating a certain kind of environment and asking certain things of guys. That is like the kind of voice that I think you like an edge that I think they will probably like someone may need to develop at some point because like. You know, like none of the guys that they have that are superstars, like really have that kind of like physical, very um, physical kind of visceral Donovan, edge to them. Donovan has said several times, like just during his media availability with, with like there, since coming to the Cavs, like this is like one of the most soft spoken rosters he's been yeah. around. Like he's trying yeah. really hard to get them to talk. 
Yeah, like he's the one who's been kind of like in everyone's face and like pushing them. Yeah, JB yeah. said the and, same and... same thing immediately. Like he literally was like, Donovan has come in and has been talking, talking, talking. And it's like it stands out that Lamar is a guy that talks and talks and talks. And like there's there's not a lot of guys Kevin that are doing... was the guy yeah. who's talking the most trash during practice today. <laughs> he was just taunting Jetty the entire time. Yeah, like I, I I think it's really important what you're bringing up here because we're like there is the number standpoint where it's like okay like how different is this than a Dean Wade but like that experience really matters like the cojones really matters like Jay Crowder is not a guy that's going to pass up an open shot in a play-in game right like so you have to weigh and this is what the Cavs will have to do like you have to weigh the fact that this is in 2015 where you have a title expectation it's win now or never kind of thing um like you're still balancing the desire to see how far you can go and how much you can win now with trying to get those developmental reps and like my personal preference and like i'm like i i fall in love with the guys that get you here right like i, mm -hmm. I even if Okoro and Wade and some of these other options, like even if they freeze up in those moments and, and they don't step up, like, all right, give these guys the opportunity to learn from it. And if they don't, that's going to be informative. But my personal bias is like, you have so much already in terms of the high end talent. And let's, let's see what we have in house. Let's see if these guys can, can learn from those struggles and, and work their way through it. Because I think the highest end outcome for the Cavs is someone like Okoro stepping up and earning and solidifying themselves as that fifth guy. Because if that option comes in house, like if Okoro puts it together offensively where he's not great, but you know, like is a functional part of the offense. They can hit those spot up threes is playing with more confidence. He's locked down slashing and all that kind of stuff that really, really make it opens up a lot of possibilities for the Cavs, right? Like you basically have a starting five that's spoken for for the future and it just becomes about supplementing that talent. Maybe you feel better about extending Karras at some point this season because you don't have to spend money on a long-term starting small forward. Like I, I just, my bias is in-house, but I, I do see the other side of the coin where there is a value of having that guy that is outspoken, that's got that dog in him, that, that's got the experience, that, that isn't going to shy away from the moment. Um, so I, at the end of the day, I think I agree with Evan's assessment the most, which is see what you have in-house and make an assessment at the trade deadline, because I, I think opportunities for a player like this are going to be available out there if you need to go that route. So I, that's where I ultimately fall to you because I think, number one, I think if you're trying to thread the needle here, you still are in thread the needle zone. And I we think if you, if you want to try to find a trade that gets you someone a little bit younger and, like, that you have, like, you can f kind of, like, the idea that you have an unlimited runway is obviously just, like, that's not true. That's not how this works. But what you do have is at least a little bit more time. You're not the Brooklyn Nets this year. You're not the Lakers who, like, are just like, can I please get a functional NBA player for these two late 2020, like, 20 this decade first round picks right like that is what you're trying to do so like if if like and, and look some team will have a year that things go badly and they need to make trades like that is going to happen and like is it the kings and harrison barnes is it the wizards and kyle kuzma like is there a player that kind of manifests themselves in a different way and you can go that route and like you can get them and then you it, it makes more sense for whatever reason but like this is this is the framework of player i think more than anything else the instructive part of this to me is that this is the framework of guy i think you're sort of looking for if you're if you are trying to find like an out-of-house option and your internal options don't develop this is the framework of a player i think you're looking for maybe a little more shooty maybe just a little bit better but that but like also like you're not going to be able to get a 20 million dollar player until the next CBA like rewrites the rules of money and like guys are in the middle of exceptions like 20 million dollars right now you're looking for like that 9 million dollar guy all of those guys have warts and all of the Cavs in-house options who like may level up in some way also are, are going to have warts and that's part of team building is really freaking hard it's really freaking hard <laughs> it is <laughs> the truest thing said on this podcast today yes um, okay, let's let's end this. End on this. Let's power rank the starting options for the small for small forward. I will go first. I'm gonna go Dean Wade one. I'm gonna go Isaac Okoro two. I'm gonna go Karis Levert three, and I'm gonna go Lamar Stevens four. I will take the reins here. I'm gonna go Isaac Okoro one, Dean Wade two, Karis Levert three, Lamar Stevens. four. Four, just in terms of starting pecking order. That's just not I'm not commenting on the 
quality or the skill set of the player. Nah, you heard it here yeah. first. That, that's how Evan ranked them as as players. You can aggregate that. Uh, anyone? Yeah. Yeah, I, I would also go Okoro, Wade, Karis, and then, you know, Dylan Windler out here turning heads. <laughs> <No>. uh, I, <laughs> He I'll, did. I'll he did look at Evan's it. media, uh, 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 media badge, media name. Be like, you work at Meta, and it was the most excited he was to say anything. His whole scrum. Well, you, you know what? I'm, I'm first, rooting for that a... guy. Like, e even if it, I, I think it's going to be tough for him to crack the rotation, but like coming back from an injury is just the hardest thing on the planet. Like, it sucks so much. Like, even for his own confidence, it's great to see him kind of up. Um, you know what? I, fourth. Not going to be popular. I don't think there's any chance it happens. I want to say Jetty Osmond for now, just because we, we've seen it. And, you know, you, you got the spacing and he plays better with a point guard. Uh, but realistically, I think it's going to come down to Okoro, Wade, or Karras. All right. Yeah, I agree with that. Preseason basketball is almost here. Check out the... Hell yeah. You play your product, you, if you're on already, go listen to the chase down. It's very good. Um... Justin, thanks so much for coming on. I appreciate you taking all this time and, and talking about more Cavs with us when you already you have your own freaking podcast that you do with the freaking team itself. And you just were like, hey, let's talk more Cavs. And you're like, you're like, yeah, I'll do that. It's fine. Dude, dude, I, I started podcasting because I need to talk Cavs and nobody in Winnipeg cares. So, you know, that this is this is what I'm here for. Anytime you need me, I'm here because I I am obsessed. I'm a loser. This is this is what I want to talk about. And this is probably the most excited I've been going into a Cavs season. It, it, the only other season that comes close is that first uh, LeBron return year, but it, it's just so much fun that we kind of already had that foundation in place and we get to still roll with that existing foundation, just with the addition of Donovan Mitchell and some vets that seem to bring a lot of fun vibes as well. Look, as long as JB Bickerstaff says nothing about fighter pilots, uh, I think we'll we'll be okay. We'll get through we'll get we'll get through the year in good fashion. Uh, thanks for making Locked On Cavs your first listen every day. This episode, as always, was produced by the indomitable Jake Stevens. We're going to be back on Monday, looking more at the 2022-23 Cavs as we think we understand them. I think we're going to do our Jared Allen season preview. Talk touch on him, talk on what's coming up for Allen after his first All Star season. So please tune in for that. Now make your second listen, Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Josh Lloyd hosts the number one daily fantasy basketball show on the planet. It's free and available wherever you get your podcast. Thanks again to Justin for coming on. I'm Chris. That was Evan. Be well.